Well, what a treat today on I-501 C the podcast for nonprofit board members. I interviewed Derek Timmerman, who's the founder of Sparrow Nonprofit Solutions based out of Golden, Colorado. And what's interesting about Derek is his background. He attended West Point. He then was deployed for a couple tours of duty in Iraq in the U.S. Army Intelligence and then worked for McKenzie and Company when he came back, when he was just charged. And then had an epiphany, if you will, a desire that, hey, I want to do something a little bit closer to the heart. So please join me as I interview Derek. Hey, I want to jump in real quick. Somebody asked me the other day, what does the Corley Company do? Well, we do three things for nonprofits. One, we facilitate meetings. Yes, like board retreats where we discuss governance and strategy with all the members of the board. Number two, advise CEOs and help them as they make decisions and implement actions to drive their mission. And then finally, we produce podcasts such as this one, but also for a number of nonprofits to help you get the word out, get your message out. So if you're interested in any of these services, please feel free to reach out to Michael at the CorleyCompany.com. Now back to the podcast. On this week's episode, I 501 CU, the podcast for nonprofit board members. I have a surprise guest. Well, a surprise to me, so to speak. He reached out to me a couple months ago, Derek Timmerman of Sparrow Nonprofit Solutions. Derek, I'm going to stop there. Introduce yourself to the audience. Tell us a little bit about how you became a nonprofit consultant, Sparrow Nonprofit Solutions, and the direction you're heading in. Well, hey, Michael. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And thanks for all the work that you do to help nonprofit leaders and um, nonprofit helpers uh, kind of do the, the good work of changing the world. Um, I am a uh, former military uh, veteran. I served... Um, two tours in Iraq. And that's kind of where this, the dedication to service was born and jumped straight from the military to uh, a consulting firm called McKinsey and Company. Um, believe it or not, there are these sort of, there's three to five, I guess, big consulting firms that every major metropolitan area, they've got a floor or two in the highest rise building. And they kind of are the consigliaries for the business world where they'll come in with a team of three, solve a big problem for the CEO, and then kind of move on to the next. It's kind of like the business special forces of, of the corporate world. I was there for six and a half years and learned all I could ever want to learn about how to improve organizations. Uh, I was traveling Monday through Thursday, Sunday through Thursday around the world, but I was helping big companies get bigger. So what I do to have like a soul recharge I would get back on Thursday night and Friday and Saturday, I would do pro bono engagements for nonprofits. So I was getting so much more soul food out of that than helping the corporations. I kind of knew that, you know what, it, it might not be where the big bucks are, but it will be where the biggest life is. And that's why I founded Sparrow Nonprofit Solutions to be the McKinsey to nonprofits. Ah. And yeah, Sparrow, the name comes from, uh, I'm a person of faith, so that name comes from the passage that uh, that goes, you are worth more than many sparrows, because so many nonprofit leaders don't feel seen or valued or um, matched in terms of their level of passion. So long-winded answer, but that's kind of how I got to where I'm at now. Well, this is fascinating. So you went to West Point, which you did not say, but I'll share it with the audience because I've read your bio. Uh, you were in intelligence, and then you deploy you come back, you work for probably one of the premier, if not the premier, management consulting firms. So you're hard, hardcore, hard charging. Have you always had a philanthropic bent to you? A passion, a compassion about you? I have. And the, 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 the negative way to say that is a hero complex. So I, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of your listeners are resonating with that diagnosis. Um, still working through it, but I've, I've at least found that the most healthy way to live out that hero complex is at least through um, work to, to change the world, to change lives. I, I think that maybe every business, every nonprofit needs its secret sauce. If I have one, it's bringing sort of the, the, the business savvy of sort of the, the top tier consulting world and merging that with the biggest hearts uh, that want to change the world. So often we find that one of those two is missing. You've got a founder who's got this huge heart for this cause, maybe a background of trauma in that field that they are kind of bringing to the nonprofit, but not necessarily sort of the the execution business chops to kind of make their world change a reality. So that's 
that uh, philanthropic bent has always been there. Um, but it's it's fun to be able to bring the best of the business world to it. Oh, I love that when that experience and business experience is is very helpful in the nonprofit space. I've, I have a business background. So let me ask you, though, when you based on your experience, differences, similarities, working with for profits and nonprofits. Yeah, for profits, there is a uh, there's at the highest levels, I guess. And there's there's a talent issue everywhere. But I'll answer the question through the lens of talent. Um, I don't know that the uh, nonprofit world approaches all of the things that it wants to do uh, as much through the lens of talent as maybe the for-profit world does. Uh, and that's that's seen everywhere, right? Um, on boards, when we, as a nonprofit, try to fill up our board seats, we are just looking for anyone who's willing to give us an hour a month to join the board meeting and be there with us. And you know we're just falling all over ourselves to be the most grateful as possible. We're not approaching that decision through the lens of talent. Whereas on the for-profit side, they they absolutely have to. Um, there's there's no other choice because uh, they have that fiduciary responsibility, as do nonprofits, but they don't sort of realize that. But like on the for-profit side, there is more of a bias to act um, to to attract, retain, develop, inspire the best. And until we get that on the nonprofit side, we're not going to see the world change that we aspire to. And do you, is there a reason, a reason on the nonprofit side, side we have not seen that, or that has not been the bent, if you will? So and, I, you're going to get some more philosophical answers than you're used to with some of these. So bear with me, Michael. But sure. uh, I, I really do believe that it, it kind of harkens back to the Judeo-Christian moorings of the nonprofit sector, where we went through this um, golden era uh, in kind of the the mid to late, you know, twentieth century, when the the kind of inertia of the Judeo-Christian ethic in the American in American life led to nonprofits not really having to work hard or perform, or as long as you had a good mission, a big heart and a requisite amount of publicity, you were going to get funded as an organization. Uh, we are into a bit of a crisis of generosity right now, if you ask me, because, you know, that, that Judeo-Christian ethic is, uh, if not waning, getting more complex. And, uh, the, the, uh, for many, many reasons, um, uh, kind of policy reasons at the government level on what's deductible, uh, even down to the off-ramp homeless person that we say no to, coding us, programming us to say no to opportunities to give. All across the board, we have these, these things that are taking us away from generosity such that, yeah, it's, it's, getting, it's getting harder out there. Mm, very insightful, Derek, and I appreciate you going a little bit philosophical. I thought that was a, really a, a compelling case. Let me ask you, so you talked a little bit about um, board members, and, and you, know, you and I both consult in that space, and what are your observations? What makes for a really effective nonprofit board member? And then to lead into the discussion also the executive director, an effective executive director, because you got experiences with both. Yeah, yeah. I, there's there's this dissonance I'm finding, and I think you find it probably too, Michael, between sort of the academic theory of boards and sort of the the ground level truth, the ugly truth of boards. Um, you know, I, I, I've read a lot, I've heard a lot quoted to me as far as like the best boards being, uh, board members being focused on governance, letting the staff do its thing. Uh, all of those things look great in a white paper. They, they make for an amazing dissertation, but I've found that the best board member smells like sweat. They are flying around. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's not the person in town who's you know, the most well-heeled, best connected um, individual who's going to really end up you know, being sort of that, that gleaming trophy board member, if you will is, you know, this person is on it, that the trophy board members are doing less and less for nonprofits these days. Um, I'd much rather have 
a 63 year old, largely retired, made his or her money, discretionary time and energy to spend, uh, upbeat, positive attitude, deep, deep devotion to the cause, who's got that ability to fly around and be uh, arms and hands and legs and voice and all the great things for the nonprofit. So in my mind, that's that dynamic active board member is what so many mid-sized and startup nonprofits need. Um, certainly, as you get up into the blue bloods of nonprofits that you know need to give fifty thousand dollars just to be considered to be on the board, I doubt that's where many of your listeners are. No, for for most nonprofits, call it ninety-five percent. We need board members smelling like sweat. Oh, I like that. And what about for an effective executive director? What have you found that makes for an exe- effective executive director? Uh, honestly, it, it's sports analogies only go so far, but uh, there's this term coming up these days when it comes to quarterbacks that I love, which is the processor of the quarterback. Mm. Uh, it's it's kind of that sort of intangible, can't really scout for it. You know, what is going to be the prioritization processor of this individual to kind of work through the defense, go through their routes and very quickly, very accurately be able to get the ball out. That prioritization processor, in my mind, is the most critical piece of being an executive director. Because let's be honest, you wake up in the morning as a founder, and there's no one really telling you what you need to do that day. There's lots of good things that you can be doing. And so many times, new founders, executive directors, they gravitate towards the operational in terms of what they're going to do with their day. You know, let's, for all the right reasons, sort of altruistically, cause-wise, they want to use that day to change a life. But maybe just maybe the the thing to make this a 50-year nonprofit that's going to change tens of thousands of lives is to work on development that day or lead generation or uh, how to to get kind of your name out there, awareness building, to build a a donation funnel. Um, All of these things are important, but that processor to be able to discern what the right way to spend my next free hour is, is in my mind, the best characteristics of a, of a executive director. Well, the, the, your, your last comment made me think of your website as I was scrolling along and you know, I didn't know you all help organizations with fundraising and, and the individual that you had quoted, basically he must've, it was a, he, he must've started the organization. He said, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I love fundraising. Now, I guess you, you had coached him through the transition from, Hated it, scared to death, and now it says, really like it. So f- absolutely fascinating to get them through that processing, if you will. So so you also do a lot of work on operations, and certainly with your experience at McKinsey, you brought that to the nonprofit space. As a board member, as a board member, what do I need to understand about nonprofit operations? What do you wish every board member understood about nonprofit operations? What I, what I wish every board member was kind of – Uh, just laser focused on are what I call the four questions. Um, This comes up early in my book, The 40 Laws of Nonprofit Impact, but it's it's really what every nonprofit needs to work through and then just relentlessly say no to everything else on. Uh, But the the four questions are, why do we exist? That's the mission. Mm -hmm. Um, What is a win? And sort of that's defining the atomic unit of winning, which is that marble, but also sort of in five years, what do we want the pile of marbles to look like in terms of if we have micro impact being this, what what is our vision for, you know, what is winning in the next three to five years, that pile of micro impact marbles that we're kind of trying to accrue. So number one, why do we exist? Number two, what is winning? Number three, who are we when we're winning? That's the values. So you're defining what are those five to seven key things uh, with some check questions phrased in the first person so that at any given time I can check myself to see, am I living up to the values? And then finally, how do we win is the strategy. What are the three repeatable things we need to do over and over again as an organization? Only three that we're repeating every week, every day, constantly, that are building that pile of marbles towards, towards winning. If... If everybody on the board is clear on the answer to those four questions and we just make every single time we get together a laser focus on how are we doing 
against against those. Um, the the impact, the, even the fundraising, will take care of itself. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's kind of where I land on it. Well, I like that answer. I like the framing of it. It's always easy to remember things in numbers for for things. So you brought up fundraising. What does a nonprofit board need to understand and know about fundraising? Yeah, I think I think they need to understand that it really is a numbers game um, that invokes all of the go for no literature that's out there on the sales side. Um, it's a uh, that's number one. I'll I'll sneak in. I'll I'll smuggle in a, a second, which is that broadcast approaches do not work when it comes to fundraising. Um, I see this with boards. I see this with founders. This sort of uh, tendency that deep, deep down they know will not work, but it's just too scary to actually go after a face-to-face conversation and make it ask. Um, it's just too comfortable to send out the email and hope that the numbers will will still work. So yeah, I'd say it's those two. It's that yeah, we we need to get our ask to win ratio correct. Um, if we're building that gift range chart, let's make sure that we're building in the fact that we need five prospects, you know, for for one yes when it comes to a gift. And what we need to be doing with those five prospects is not sending them an email. It's it's getting ourselves to that fearless place, that joyfully fearless place of making those in-person asks. Well stated. And it really is. Fundraising is art and science and it is sales. I know it's blasphemy to say it, but it really is uh, you know, effective sales. And you said it very eloquently. Um, so you also do executive coaching, work with uh, leaders in the nonprofit space at, at all levels. What are the current issues that you're seeing that they're facing and project a little bit out into the future for maybe some aspiring leaders? What are going to be some of the challenges? So current and going into the future. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it, we've already talked about one, which is prioritization. Um, that is, that is a big one and it, it colors everything else. Um, two, I would say, and this is also sort of forward leaning looking out is, what do nonprofit leaders do with this crisis of generosity? Um, is it is it going to be the case? And I've seen many nonprofits doing this, where you actually need to embrace an increasing amount of gross in your donor base in order to to get your organization funded. Um, that looks like a lot of different things. Um, uh, you know, I. I know there's probably, you know, guests who come on and are tempted to just give this rosy picture of the nonprofit world that everyone who gives in that $2,500, $5,000, $10,000 amount, those major givers are doing so from the absolute purest possible place. And the answer is that they're not. So nonprofit leaders are having to to kind of make a lot of hard choices about uh, you know, whether we do, you know, cozy up, if we're a children serving nonprofit and we've got this, you know, group of drunken rabble rousers over here that are just, you know, have total values mismatch, not just in the drinking, but in terms of, you know, this guy and his comments and how he treats women and what he believes about the family and just everything. Like there is, there are temptations out there to embrace whatever sources of funding that will be out there. So holding the line on values aligned donors um, because of this crisis of generosity is going to be tough. This is why I say, and I think it's it's probably something you and I'll touch on maybe a bit later in the conversation, but it's, it, it's, it's shifting from contributions to having something to sell. Um, I, I take the controversial position that every nonprofit can sell something every single one and to to start to get it to get comfortable with that world and start moving that way before the crisis of generosity truly strips us of all contributions uh, might be might be important for most nonprofits to do sooner rather than later so that's a great segue into the, uh, my next question is uh, you know I, i've heard the term earned income you mm-hmm. know social enterprise uh, they're, they're related they're in the same 
uh, playing field. But talk a little bit about you. In fact, you wrote a blog on your website that I thought was fascinating, and I'll read it. The title, Nonprofits Should Sell Things. We should s stop begging for bucks and start making for markets. Talk a little bit about your philosophy, what it means, and how organizations transition and move into that. Yeah, one of my favorite games to play with mastermind groups or groups of nonprofit leaders or when I speak at a conference is to challenge someone to come up with a nonprofit that cannot sell something. And invariably, we have somebody raises their hand, like shares, we actually serve, we're an international facing nonprofit that serves uh, uh, school children, school girls, women and girls in Senegal. How in the world would you tell us that we could possibly sell anything? And they're not done with asking the question yet. And I've already got some kind of way that we can take schools and school kids here in the United States, link them up as pen pals with these individuals that are overseas. And it's actually the schools that help fund these matchmaking relationships that turn into an educational opportunity for school kids in the US or actual trips that go over that connect, um, call it philanthropic tourism, right? Where you've got individuals who care about the cause, pay to go visit, want to see another country. And it ends up being a little bit like a traditional looking church missions trip, except you're going in support of this nonprofit to see the world in a new way. Every nonprofit can sell something that gives value to some constituency. And I, I have yet to find a nonprofit and maybe one of your listeners will look me up and find one or pose one, but I, I do accept the challenge. I, I love this topic. Well, I hope they I hope they listen. They do challenge you on it. So what I'm hearing you say is really any nonprofit ought to look at the opportunity to sell, literally sell exchange services for money or product for money and use that money to help further your mission. It's doable. You've seen it. And it's something every nonprofit ought to consider. Every nonprofit. Yeah. And the, the place where you see this is with nonprofits that have a lot of property. And you think about the church world, the ministry world. Um, what is happening with these buildings in some cases, you know, on property that's, you know, worth tens of millions of dollars, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for, nothing is happening in these buildings. You've got, you've got ministries, church organizations discovering shamefully for the first time that they could actually use, like use that space as community co-working space to actually bring people together in, in co-working environments. There's always been preschools and things, but that's usually only a part of the building. If, if you have listeners out there that have a facility or um, have sort of unused time in that space, that's another way. So lots of ideas that most nonprofits haven't even kind of walked down the road to, to think through. But, you know, maybe something board members, especially business oriented board members can help, can help think through. Because if you, you said earlier in the conversation, the executive director is so busy, focused on trying to save lives. Sometimes it's and change lives. It's, it's tough to take a step back and think strategically through, wow, can we deploy these assets in a way that really drives our mission a little bit for, further? It is. Yeah, that, that is a place where a board member can come in. I will I will add if they are willing to help co-lead it. Um, mm. Let's not let's not turn the boardroom into this sort of uh, in the military. Can I you might edit this out. Go for it if you have to. But we had a term in the military that was GFI, good blank idea. And boardrooms have lots of GFIs. Oh, yes. <laughs> they, yeah. they do. And I love I, I don't know about you when you facilitate board meetings and retreats. I, I, I welcome the opportunity to challenge people on that because I used to be that idea guy sitting on the board. And boy, you can walk out with 100 great ideas and you can just see the look on that executive director's face going, oh, no, <laughs> there's, there's no way. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, oh, I love it. So what do you think most people misunderstand about nonprofit organizations and nonprofit leaders? You know, I, 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 I think that the big misunderstanding is, is this sort of implicit vow of self-deprecating, self-sacrificing, self-sabotaging poverty that nonprofit leaders um, sign up for when they get going. Um, we've even baked that systemically into all of this overhead conversation, which 
I'm sure has come up many, many times on your podcasts, which is the the villainy that is overhead uh, as far as tracking it and all that kind of thing where, yeah, but, but kind of the philosophy underlying that and there's a seed of truth in everything and you got to find it and charitably deal with it is that if we take it charitably, the seed of truth in that is back to the Judeo-Christian ethic of many of the systems that we have in the nonprofit world is kind of this Mother Teresa picture is that every nonprofit leader is emptying their entire lives to do this thing such that all of the funding is okay going to the the operations the the what's going to actually end up saving changing lives um, and to get the talent into the nonprofit world that we need we we need to kind of think differently we need to think about investment such that i'm in denver metro it is um near impossible for a nonprofit leader uh, who's, you know, trying to make a living to, to do it only through uh, their, their work in the nonprofit. So that's maybe a big misunderstanding is everybody signed up to be a Mother Teresa. No, we, we, need to, we need to elevate the incentives for talent to flow to the nonprofit world if we're going to solve some of the world's most intractable problems. Mm, which really goes back to how you opened up the conversation when I asked you about the difference between for-profit and non-profits mm-hmm. and really how they view things and for-profits are willing to bring in the talent and pay for it, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Non-profits, not so much, or at least it's, it's looked at with a little bit of a shady eye mm-hmm. when you bring in somebody like that. I want to ask you about your, your book because I'm looking at it over your, your left shoulder. And I'm curious, always curious of authors. So it's The 40 Laws of Nonprofit Impact. When did you write it and why did you write it? And who needs to read it? Oh we'll, my goodness. we'll put a little plug in for you. So love it. Yeah, when, why, and who needs to read it? Yeah, this was my my kind of work over the course of two or three years leading up to its publication in late 2021. Um, this is my love letter to the nonprofit world, and I wanted to take 40 different vignettes from sort of household name nonprofits that have made it one way or the other, and there's something we can learn from those. So we start with, you know, in good McKinsey fashion, we start with a case study of one of these sort of nonprofit leaders or nonprofits, and then flow that into just a punchy, short 1500 word little um, lesson that we can kind of take away from that story, a law of nonprofit life. And you take all these together and really you can, as a founder, or someone even who's been in the nonprofit world for some length of time, you can take this and it ends up being sort of a paint by numbers script of how to really make your nonprofit um, achieve everything that you wanted to achieve from initially getting it going to uh, talent management, as we talked about, to fundraising, to operations, it's all there. So I, I wanted it to be a kind of holistic resource that could answer all the questions that you need, a one-stop shop for nonprofit leaders. Um, and I've, I've been blessed to hear from a lot of a lot of leaders that it has ended up bearing out that way for them and how they've used it. Oh, wonderful. I assume everybody can get it on Amazon. Anywhere else? Or is that the most logical place to go? Amazon, best place to go. Yeah, that's where it is. All right. All right. The 40 Laws of Nonprofit Impact. You heard it here. So last question, because this is a podcast for nonprofit board members, any advice? you'd like to give them to help them, each nonprofit board member be more effective? Yeah, I I would just say, take some some time as a board to really do a board retreat well. Uh, The service that we call that at Sparrow is Board Spark. And it's one of our four service lines. And what we do is we interview every single board member ahead of time, one-on-one and then go into a one night, two day board retreat over a weekend where that is a different board emerging from that board retreat. And we have given them just wind in their sails to become a very different nonprofit, a very different board, um, a very different world changing organization. So I'm a firm believer that a, a well prepared for and orchestrated board retreat can not just change that nonprofit, but can change a whole community. So really give some thought to doing one of those as a board member if, um, if, if you haven't done one yet. 
or like that, invest in yourselves. Boards, invest in yourselves. It'll pay off in spades, as Derek said. So, ladies and gentlemen, Derek Timmerman, the founder of Sparrow Nonprofit Solutions, author of The 40 Laws of Nonprofit Impact. Impact, he is based in greater Denver metro area. I think that's the right terminology. And it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today, Derek. Thank you so much. Such a joy, Michael. Thank you for having me. Take care. All right. Now we'll move into recapping with Reed. Reed, we just talked to Derek. What resonated with you? The first thing that resonated with me was his four questions that board members need to understand about operations. They are, why do we exist? The mission. What is a win? The vision. Who are we when we're winning? The values. And how do we win? The strategy. Yeah, he really framed that well. And, and uh, to our listeners, who, when you follow us on LinkedIn, you'll probably see that again, I would guess. <laughs> anyway, number two, Reed. The broadcasting approach to fundraising does not work as well as getting in front of somebody and having that personal touch. Yeah, straight to the point, but very well articulated. Number three, Reed. And the best board members smell like sweat. So, linking on to another point he made, when you have those great ideas volunteer to lead that 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 idea don't just throw ideas out there you get a little put a little work in and get sweaty you know thanks to derek you and i are always going to think of the smelly board member now as the effective board member the way he framed that i thought that was that was quite cute and uh, memorable so there you have it ladies and gentlemen recapping with reed as he recapped our conversation with derek timmerman and so i will i501 see you all next week <laughs>